He goes down as probably the most talented player I've ever seen. Just an elite football brain. Could have been absolutely anything. Hi everyone, my name's Julian Trantino and I'm from the Don's Digital team. While we wait for footy to return, we're pleased to bring you a five-part series with Adrian Dodoro, the club's GM of List and Recruiting. Leading the club's recruiting for 22 years, Adrian has a wealth of draft stories that he'll be sharing exclusively on the podcast. We hope you enjoy it and apologies for the audio in the first couple of minutes. We sorted it out, so enjoy the rest of the episode. Well, Adrian, great to have you on the show again. I thought we'd take it back all the way to 1998 for this one, your very first draft at the Bombers and your first pick, Dean Rioli, in the rookie draft. What a pick it was. Can you talk us through how he ended up at Bomberland? Yeah, well, that was an interesting one. Back then, the uh, the rookie draft was in March um, and he had played for South Fremantle uh, the previous year uh, as a 19-year-old and you know, as you all know, Dean was a little bit overweight back then and actually had a bit of a knee problem and didn't look the most aesthetically pleasing player on the on the eye uh, physically. But He just had sublime skills and a beautiful feel for the game. And I was fortunate enough in a previous job that I was able to get to Western Australia and I saw him play in the grand final over there. So when I got the job at Essendon, the first person I wanted to recruit was Dean Rioli. And the funny thing in the backstory with Dean was um, obviously... You know, I'm excited to to draft a guy like Dean with his ability and what have you. But um, I remember calling his name out at the draft and there was a, a team, I won't mention who that team was, and I just started laughing. And I thought, geez, what have I done here? Um, and I'll never forget that. It was my, my first ever pick in a national draft and to have a team opposite us uh, on, at the actual draft laugh, I thought, oh, geez, I mustn't know what I'm doing here. Um but that was basically because the way Dean had prepared himself physically. Once we got him to Melbourne, and that was another story in itself, you could see quite clearly once we got the weight off him, he was going to be a super player. And the thing is, I don't think we ever saw the best of Dean Rioli. Um, and I've said it a, a number of times, had Dean been in today's environment where it's full-time and you know full-time nutritionists and, and dietitians and weights programs and, um, and what have you, he would have been an absolute star of the competition and... I know he played 100 games and, um, you know, he excited Essendon fans on many occasions. But unfortunately, he missed out on the 2000 grand final because he broke his collarbone against the Bulldogs early in the game in 2000. He should have been a premiership player, um, but uh, a player that, uh, unfortunately, I don't think we saw the best of. Yeah, well said. And it was a shame that we didn't get to see more of Dean. Of course, some sublime skills and a wonderful Footballer. I just wanted to talk about the Kevin Sheedy influence. How, how big was it back in 98 when you were looking at Dean? We know Sheeds has got such a, a fascination with the talent to come out of Tiwi as well. Oh, absolutely. And, and Sheeds, um, as everyone knows, is a great supporter of Indigenous talent. He pioneered a lot of the initiatives, uh, not to mention Dreamtime and um, you know, what, he, what he's done for the Aboriginal community uh, and introduced him to AFL footy in many fronts has been unbelievable. And as soon as I, you know, I said to Sheeds that I was keen on Dean and funnily enough, I, I remember it as if it was yesterday. He knew who he was. He knew exactly where he was from. Um, and he just said, yeah, let's do it. And, um, and that's what Sheeds was all about, supporting young blokes. And he might not have come out of the Tech Cup program and, he might not have come out of, you know, elite, uh, you know, academies, but Sheeds knew that he had the talent. And once we got him into our program, that um, we could get him to a level. And John Quinn, our fitness coach at the time, did an amazing job to, to get him to play some reasonably good footy for us. So back then in 98, can you talk us through what the recruiting team looked like? Was it just you? Did you have some support? And, and I guess uh, you probably would have had to lean on Sheeds a fair bit, wouldn't you? Yeah, absolutely. Sheeds and I were hand in glove and, and, and always were. Different times back then. I remember when I got the job in '98. I looked, you know, I, I basically took over from Noel Judkins and sat in an empty office. There was nothing there. There was absolutely nothing in the office, and there was no manual on how to be a recruiting manager. It was, um, yeah, suck it up and and see how you go. And one thing I was fortunate enough was I I did inherit uh, a very good team of national spotters around Australia at the time who who were you know brilliantly trained by Noel. Um, and 
so I was fortunate in that regard, but it was nothing like it is today. Um, the science of today, the technology of today, compared to what, is, what it was in 98. We, back then we were studying um, off VHS tapes. Now it's all computerized. We can, we've got edits of players uh, at, at, you know, at our fingertips. Um, and, and it was a lot more visualization back then than what it is now. And, and Sheeds was the master of visualization. Uh, he taught me so much about the art of uh, imagination, the, the, you know, the, the imagination of what a player looks like in a jumper and what he looks like playing it, you know, on the MCG. Um, and one of the things I did as a, a recruit was study Sheeds. Um, there's no, there's no academy or no, um, university to learn about this sort of stuff. So I felt that I had no better mentor, educated teacher than Sheeds. And I, I studied his career and I studied the way he thought about football, the way he thought about footballs and the way he developed footballers. And, you know, you go back to a guy like, um, Kevin Walsh, who no one saw in Kevin Walsh what Sheeds did. Yet he went on to be a fabulous premiership player, um, played for Victoria. Uh, and he just stuck with him for about three years because he knew he had what it took to play the game. Um, and I'd like to think that one of my um, benefits of learning off sheets is having that ability to be patient with players um, and 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 see him develop over a period of time. So, no, Sheets is amazing. He's clearly been a huge influence on so many people. But how did your relationship begin with Sheets? Uh, like a lot of people, you know, Sheets took me under his wing at Essendon, and I sat in the coach's box with him for many, many years, and he used to keep telling me, this is going to be the best apprenticeship of your life. Ended up being a 12-year apprenticeship. Um, and it was fabulous just to, to sit next to him in, in, the, in the senior coach's box for a number of years. I was also fortunate enough to work alongside, co- in the reserves, um, to work alongside, you know, Neil Danaher and Dennis Pagan, um, Merv Kane, um, you know, Dave Weed and Kevin Morris, uh, Mark Williams, you know, fabulous names, in the game and these are all people that Sheeds brought along and um, he gave me a, a, an opportunity to, to work with these guys and they helped formulate what my philosophies are on recruiting today. We know how well clubs are set up these days to help players transition from interstate. Uh, back then when Dean Rioli came to the Bombers, he had to transition from Perth. How did the club and you in particular help him to settle in? <laughs> it's actually quite funny. Um, so back then it was the, the rookie draft was in March and uh, I rang Dean up and said, uh, you know, we're, we're taking him in the draft and he was wrapped and he was an Essendon supporter and he was living in Perth, a guy called Clem Michael who uh, was playing at South Fremantle, later got drafted to Fremantle, a very good player in his own right. And uh, we organised for Dean to fly over on a, um, on a Saturday morning and he was going to come over and play in a practice match that particular day. As I said, it was back, it was March in those days. So I go to the airport and I'm waiting for Dean. The plane arrives. There's probably you know, 200, 300 people on this Perth flight, waiting, waiting, waiting. No Dean Rioli. <laughs> anyway, finally tracked him down and he's still in Perth. I said, Dean, what happened? He goes, oh, you're not going to believe this. We had this unbelievable power blackage. And, I've, you know, the alarm didn't go off and I missed my flight. And I thought, oh, God, what have I got myself into? He's my first ever draft pick. And the bugger didn't even hop on the plane. He's made up this this story. Anyway, he finally got here the following week. And I went to the airport, picked him up. And he arrived and he had this little suitcase, this little green suitcase, a bag it was. It was like those little school bags that, you know, you used to take to school when you were in primary yeah. school. Anyway, he came off the flight. And I said to him, oh, we'll go to the carousel and we'll get your luggage. And he goes, no, 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 this is it. And I've gone, oh, no, he, he's got no intention of staying here. <laughs> he's going home. And we ended up playing a practice match that day um, against North Melbourne. It was actually, uh, back then it was a night competition and we and the reserves played a, a game beforehand. And he wobbled around. He only had one kick. And I thought to myself, what have I done? Can you imagine all these Essendon people thinking, who the hell's Adrian drafted here? I'll never forget Kevin Egan, who, you know, a very famous bloke around our footy club, come up and goes, don't worry, mate, he'll be right. He can play. And I thought, geez, thank God he saw something because he only had one kick. Um, the following week, we played round one uh, against Richmond at Punt Road. And again, you know, Dean's probably tipping the scales at over 100 kilos. 
He's come out and he's kicked eight goals in the first half. And everyone just went, wow. This, it was unbelievable. In the second half, well, he ran out of gas and couldn't get a kick. <laughs> but it was enough to see just how much talent he had. And um, you know, I think about 12, uh, you know, 10 weeks later, we put him in the seniors and um, you know, the rest was history. But, yeah, back then it was different, you know, because I actually was also the welfare manager back then. So I was doing recruiting and welfare. So uh, not only was I recruiting him, but I was looking after his welfare as well. And and Dean, like most of the guys back then, were uh, you know all colourful characters. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll leave it at that. But uh, different times back then. Yeah, absolutely. And a bit also just being that that port of call there for his welfare. How real was the go home factor for Dean during his time at Essendon? Were, were there times where he was close to leaving? Oh, absolutely. And. You know, he had the, the, the ties back on uh, back at Tiwi and, and Darwin and, and obviously in Western Australia. So really challenging times. And if you remember correctly, back then, being part-time football, they spent a lot of time at home. Um, whereas now the boys are engaged a lot more and there's a lot more resources around them. Like we've got three welfare people uh, at Essendon now. You know, I've got a, a recruiting, you know, full-time recruiting staff, uh, a number of people compared to back then when there was absolutely no one. So... It was difficult, it was challenging, and there were times when Dean wanted to go home, uh, like a lot of players from interstate. Um, but the good thing about Dean was he, he, he came across Sheeds, and Sheeds always supported all the boys, particularly the Indigenous boys. He understood what they were, who they were as people, and what they required in their lives. And there were a number of times where we just let him go home for a couple of weeks and had to send Longy up to go get him, but uh, he always came back. Mm. He would have he would have been a two thousand premiership player if not for that unfortunate broken collarbone in round twenty one. He described missing out on two thousand as the hardest moment of his career. How big a toll do you think it had on him? Oh, I would have heard him for sure because the one thing that Dean wanted was a premiership. He wanted to be an Essendon premiership player. Uh, he had a genuine love for it, the Essendon Footy Club before he even got there, and that was one thing that appealed to all of us. Um, and you know, if you look back at that 2000 year, it was an amazing year by by the club. And he was, you know, he was the the player that was just, you know, cream on the cake. But he also did a lot of work off the footy for, you know, for guys like Lloydie uh, and Scotty Lucas because he was a very, very selfless, smart forward. You know, he knew how to create space. He knew he had the deft touch by hand. You know, he could put the ball, you know, on, on, a, on Lloydie's chest. Um, you know, he was a bit of an architect as a forward because he had that elite football brain. Um, and look, he was missed. Fortunately, we won the flag. He had his chance in 2001, played in the, in the grand final. We couldn't get over the line, but you know, he deserved to be in that, in that premiership team, no doubt. Yeah. You mentioned his kicking going inside 50. It was absolutely sublime. I've got this quote from Sheeds. He said, Dean was a beautiful kick and he could see the whole picture. He was one of the best disposers of the ball that I coached, every time he got it, our forwards' eyes would light up like Luna Park. Yeah. Do you think if it wasn't for those those chronic knee and back injuries, would, would he have been a champion of the club? How far do you reckon he would have gone? Oh, look, I've, look, I've been at the club for a long, long time, as most people know, and he goes down as probably the most talented player I've ever seen um, at Essendon. He's up there. He's up there with, with some of the most talented players. Um, just an elite football brain, uh, and if he would have had the you know the body to to match um, the skill and the footy brain, he could have been absolutely anything. Mm. Um, but you know what? There's a lot of players like that that have gone through their journeys, and he's just one of them, unfortunately. Do you still keep in touch with him? I mean, how does that relationship between a recruiter and a player extend beyond just that draft phase and then those initial years at the club? Oh, look, it gets difficult. I uh, haven't seen Dean probably for 12 months. He he came into the office, uh, I reckon, last year. Uh, he was actually considering doing a bit of work with our NGA stuff uh, and then um, uh, had some other business interests that he uh, had to take up instead. But he's always welcome at Essendon. He's been to a few of our games and, um, you know, one of those really popular characters that uh, that you want to see uh, at the club is actually quite f- another funny f- story is that she just kept saying we've got to get him to 100 games you know we got him to about 70 you could see the body the knee was playing up and he started having really chronic hamstring problems and 
You know, the body was just starting to fall apart. Chiefs kept saying, we've got to get him to 100. We've got to get him to 100. You know, one day this bloke is going to produce father-sons for this football club. Anyway, we got him to 100 games and... Uh, as you know, he'd only produced a daughter, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, one day there might so be an AFLW team but, here, uh, so. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. But it was one of those funny shoot side stories all the time that, um, you know, got to get him to 100, and unfortunately uh, he hasn't produced a boy yet, but hopefully he will. You never know. Of course, we can't speak about 98 without mentioning Mark Johnson, another great rookie list success for the club. He went on to, to play in the 2000 Premiership. How did... How did Mark come to the, the club's attention? John, I played at Calder Cannons as, uh, as a top ager and actually didn't get drafted. Um, and boy, was he dirty at the time about not getting drafted. Um, so the club uh, at the time um, offered him a supplementary role with our VFL team and he played um, as a 19-year-old in our VFL team. So I was fortunate enough to, to see him firsthand in our VFL team and... And he, he, you know, coached by Bomber at the time. I remember Bomber was a, a big advocate for uh, for Mark uh, for Mark Johnson. Um, yeah, he loved his toughness. There was a question mark on his his disposal by foot. Um, and once John O knew that was the issue, he just worked on it and you know, brutally tough. Um, played with his heart. Great team man, uh, and he deserved his spot. And, and got on the senior list the following year and played in the premiership team and became a fabulous player for our footy club. Yeah, great story indeed. Well, Adrian, it's been great to chat to you about, I guess, your, your first year as a, an official recruiter for the club and we'll be back for, for more episodes and uh, look forward to chatting to you next week. No worries. Thanks very much.